In this passage of scripture that we've just read from, um, I'm going to focus on that in a minute, but I'm not going to give you a detailed background of everything about the book of Job, but if most people probably know the facts and what happened for, to a man named Job. Interestingly, this book in its writing predates the books of Moses. What does that mean? It was written before the books of Moses. You got Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, the five books, the Pentateuch. Those books came after the book of Job. But yet we start in Genesis. Why? Because it's the book of beginnings. So God revealed to Moses on the mount those things that we have in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, those five books. But the actual time of writing, this book came first. And I'm not going to go into all the, the, the apologetics behind it, but just it is, it is a book that is, was written prior to the books of Moses there. And in this book, what we have is a man going through trials. Now, sometimes, and again, there, there is a balance here. Some people don't understand this balance. And uh, let me just say this. If you don't know Jesus Christ as Savior, some of these things may or may not make sense to you, okay? But for those who know Christ, sometimes testings and trials come um, because of, you know, just God allows things to happen. Sometimes they come because maybe God's trying to get our attention. As I mentioned in the Sunday school hour this morning, Hebrews chapter 12 talks about the chastening hand of God. So God, you know what God does? God uses what's called progressive chastisement. When, when, when we have the Lord's table, I always read the passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And in that passage, he says that the Corinthian believers, Paul wrote to them and said this, because they were abusing the Lord's table, some were weak, some were sick, and some sleep. Just to give you a quick explanation. So God says sometimes he can allow or bring a weakness in your life. If you're a child of God by faith in Jesus Christ, you're saved, you know Christ, you're not trusted in your works, a baptism, a church membership, but it's Christ and Christ alone. As that, in that position, God says, sometimes if you're not doing right, okay, God can bring weakness. It doesn't mean all weakness for a believer is because you're in sin, Okay, but sometimes God can work in that way. The second way that God can work is uh, or, or, uh, weakness is sickness. So sickness, see, there was no sickness before the fall of man in the garden. That came as a result. Their bodies were perfect. Amen? When sin entered the world, everything changed. Everything changed. The whole world, we mentioned a little bit of that in Romans chapter 8 when you read down through verses uh, 18, 19, 20, down to 24 and 25. We did that in Sunday school. This whole world's in groaning and travailing. That's what it says in those verses in Romans 8. And by the way, he says, you're groaning and travailing. You ever notice that as you get older? <laughs> hey, man, where are we? We start groaning, travailing, just aches and pains that you never had before. We all face that. Amen? Amen. And so, but sometimes sickness may come in a person's life for a believer because they're not right with God. They're not obeying God. They're stubborn. They're not following the Lord. They're not doing what they're supposed to do. Sometimes sickness comes for that. God can allow that. God can allow that. And the last thing that God uses is sleep. Now, when he said the word sleep, he did not mean what you do when you lay your head on your pillow in the sense of getting some rest. He meant this. In John 11, the Bible, we just celebrated the resurrection not too long ago. In John 11, the Bible talks about a man named Lazarus, that, that Jesus rose from the dead. And this man, he told the disciples, he says, uh, I, go, uh, I go to uh, uh, raise, uh, rise up, uh, raise uh, Lazarus up from his sleep. And they didn't understand. The disciples didn't understand it. Don't ever think if you were there, you would have understood everything. Uh, uh I don't believe that. I do not believe I would have either. If I was born and raised in, in, in uh, uh, my heritage as Jewish back in that day, and you were raising that, that kind of mindset and everything, it's not that you couldn't get saved and you couldn't see. It's just that they, had, they really struggled with understanding 
Jesus Christ. They really did. Even the closest of followers struggled, and they did not even believe that he would rise from the dead. How about that? That's pretty rough. So when he, after he went to the gravesite, he said that, and then the disciples said, what do you mean, Jesus? If you sleep, let's go wake him up. And Jesus had to speak plainly, the Bible says, and he says, he, Lazarus is dead. I'm going to raise him from the dead. But they didn't get it at first, okay? So, so sometimes God can take you home. In the epistles of John, we're going to get to it sometime. There is a sin unto death. Now, different people take different angles on that. I believe God, listen, if God could take home Ananias and Sapphira in the book of Acts, he can definitely take someone out in 2024. You say, what happened? To you got to read your Bible. Who is, the, who is Ananias and Sapphira? They said they were going to, they were going to sell a piece of land. They were going to sell this land, and they were going to give it all. No one told them they had to give it all. They just made it very public. Right, we're going to give it all. And we're going to give all of that to the Lord, to the church, whatever. And then when it came down to it, uh, Peter said, asked him a couple questions. First, I think it was the husband came in and says, listen, where, where, you know, did you, did you do what you said? And then next thing you know it, he said, yeah, all of a sudden, right there, drop dead. Between the wife and the husband, at separate occasions, they had to carry their bodies out. God killed them. They lied. You think, whoa, if God did that today, because you lied and said you were going to do something, I think we'd have a lot of dead people. I'm not saying he couldn't, by the way, and I'm not saying he doesn't. Amen. Some people, are, I don't know about that. I'm not, you know. So why don't we just take God seriously to his word? His word says what he tells us what we should do, and do it because you love him. Amen. And uh, so let's be careful with that. So when you got this book of Job here, he's going through these trials and testings. And what God says right from the get-go what happens is Satan has access to the throne of God. Satan is a, a fallen angel, the Bible teaches us. You read that Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28. And, and, but anyway, he, 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 he came up and he says, um, the Lord says unto Satan in, in the very first chapter in verse 8, he says, have you considered my servant Job? In other words, God's saying this. When you get down and you look at all of this stuff, He's basically God saying, I have confidence in Job. I know him. And I know he's going to pass the test. He said to Satan, what do, you, what do you want to do here? And Satan was basically saying, oh, he only loves you. He only serves you because he's, he's blessed. Uh, pr he's prosperous. He's blessed materially. You know, he, he, no, I, I, you know the devil says, I, I don't believe that for a minute. I don't believe he really loves you. Just let me have Adam. And the Lord let it. God allowed. But I don't know if you know this, but the devil's on a leash. That's what 1 Peter 5, 8 says. He's a roar, he is as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. So with this situation of Job, God says, I have complete confidence in Job. He's going to pass the test. What do you want to do? He says, okay, I give you permission. He gave the devil permission to afflict Job. What happened? He lost his family, his possessions. He faced a financial reversal. So then Satan comes back to him and says, hey, listen, how about this? What if you, you know, if, if he gets sick, if we just allow me to allow some sickness in his life, and I know he's going to curse you. I know he's going to curse you. And God says, no, I don't believe that for a minute. What does God do? He says to Satan, hey, listen, whatever you do, you can't kill him. But you know what? Go ahead, afflict him. Bible says he was afflicted with boils from head to toe. Can you imagine that? Wow. And you know what the Bible says? I'll read the last. We, we sing a song in our church called uh, Blessed, Blessed Be the Name. And it comes from this verse. In the first chapter, chapter 1, verse 21, he said, Naked, Job says, Naked came I out of my mother's womb. Naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave. And the Lord hath taken away. By the way, that's a good verse there for against assisted suicide. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. You don't take them away. Amen. Oh, yeah. Oh, we've crossed some bridges in this country. 
The Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all of this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. Wow. He was a man of character. The Bible says in that first chapter, the Bible says that he was a man of, of a holy man, a righteous man. He, God says this, that there is none like him in the earth. He's a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. This guy was a good man, a godly man, and trouble came. I don't think, I, I would never say I am of the same character that Job was. You know what the Bible tells us in the New Testament? That God said there's no, there's not a greater man born of woman than John the Baptist. That's what Jesus said. God said this in the Old Testament about Job, pretty much the same idea, like, He's a godly man. So anyway, so through all of that, he goes through all of this, and it, he faces the personal health problems. He even faces some criticism from his wife. And then he's got these three friends that they have this discourse. The bulk of the book is all about this conversation back and forth, these three guys and Job. <laughs> and sometimes you think, when you think your friends are there for you, they're not. Oh, you must be in sin, Job. That's why God's allowing this. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> but that's what they said back and forth and all of this and all a bunch of stuff was said. But we're not going to focus on all that. So you got a little bit of background just in case you've never re read the book of Job. But in this chapter, we're going to focus on these verses. And in verse in, uh, of this chapter, in verse 8, where we started reading today, the Bible says this. It's interesting. It is interesting when you look at this, Job is, there's something that is, is missing from what Job is saying here, okay? So what he wants to do, he wants to, he desires to appear before God, and he wants to bring his case before God. And by the way, he does. But you know what? The Lord sets him straight. And you know what? When you have a conversation with God, I'll tell you something. If you receive it well, you'll come out humble. you always come out humble. Amen. So what happens is in verse 8, he says, Behold, I go forward, but he's not there. See, he's confessing his lack of understanding about God and how, how God works and how God reveals. And he says, and so he's going forward. So if you go forward, you're going this way. If, and he says, and backward, verse 8, he says, I cannot perceive him. Then on the left hand, so you got this way, this way, now you got this way, the left hand where he doth work, but I cannot behold him. He hideth myself, himself on my right hand. I cannot see him. Does anybody know what's missing? Up. Up. We're looking this way, this way, this way, this way. You need to look up. You need to look up. You know what the Bible says? Look at Psalm 121. Keep your place there. Go to Psalm 121. It's the next book, so you don't have to go hunting for it, okay? Keep your place in, Psalm, in Job 23 and go to Psalm 121. Psalm 121. We'll quickly mention this, and then we'll get on the, the, the words about the trial, the testing that we face in this life. Psalm 121. The Bible says this. Are you ready? I will, what? Lift up mine eyes. Psalm 121, verse 1. Are you there, everybody? It's just the next book. You got Job and then Psalms. It should be a short hop, skip, and a jump to get there. Amen? I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord which made heaven and earth. There's a song that we sing. <laughs> I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills. I won't sing it to y'all. You gotta lift your head, your eyes up. Look up, look up, look up. You know what he says? I will lift up my eyes. When you're going through something, you know what? It's a choice of your will to look up. He says, I will. Are you doing that? No, I'm just so discouraged and depressed and downtrodden. Hey, you want help? Look up, look up, look up, look up. 
I'm looking this way, I'm looking that way, I'm looking that way, there's no help, there's no help. Hey, look up. You say, you say, Pastor, shouldn't there be some Christian friends there by my side? Yes, you're right, they should be. And shouldn't they be there lifting you up? Yes, the Bible teaches all that. But sometimes you're all alone. But you're really not because you got God if you're saved. You got the Lord. And God says, I want you just to look up. Look up. Look up. God wants you to look up. Amen. Oh, you know, I, I, I shared this story um, a week or two ago. There's a story of a boy who one day found a gold coin on the street. And even after this, he kept his eyes on the ground as he walked, watching for coins. And during a long lifetime, he found a good number of coins. But meanwhile, he never saw the flowers and the trees which grew such in such wondrous beauty everywhere. He never saw the hills, the mountains, the sweet valleys, the picturesque landscapes. He never even saw the blue sky. To him, this lovely world meant only a dusty road, dreary, unbeautiful, and merely a, pl merely a place uh, in which to look for coins. I think some of God's people need to be looking up more. I really do. Oh, I'm telling you, without that, listen, without the up look, it's bleak. Amen? The problem is we don't look up. Corey Ten Boom said this, look around and be distressed. Look inside and be depressed. Look at Jesus and be at rest. I'll say it again. Look around and be distressed. Look inside and be depressed. And look at Jesus. By the way, look at Jesus. Look up. Amen. And be at rest. How about that? Praise God. You got to look up. You got to look up. That's what God wants you to do today. Are you looking up? Are you looking up today? God wants you to do that. Praise God. Well, listen. So he said he was looking, but he didn't look up. That was, that was something there that he should have thought about. Now look at, go back to Job again. Job, and look at chapter 23, verse 10. He knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. I shall come forth as gold. You know what? In this passage, he, there's a bunch of things he says. First of all, God says, he says this, he knoweth the way that I take. Who is he speaking about? God, the Lord, now, right? He. So can you remember this? God hasn't forgotten you. He knows who you are. As someone wrote a song, he knows my name. He knows your name. He knows who you are. He has not forgotten you. You may think he's forgotten you, but he has not forgotten you. Amen? Praise God for that. He knoweth the way that I take. And you know what? He says, when he hath tried me. You know, God's got a purpose. What did we sing here? If I got the paper here, where is it? Underneath here, somewhere. Here it is. That we just sang. God never moves without purpose or plan. Isn't that biblical? Yes. When trying his servant... And molding a man, God's trying to mold you. Jeremiah chapter 8 talks about that, how that people are on a wheel. Uh, they're like, we're made of clay, amen? And that, that God's trying to mold us. He's trying to conform us to the image of Jesus Christ, Romans chapter 8. That's what he's trying to do. Some of God's people are fighting what God's purpose and plan is. He wants you to be like Christ. And then he says here, the songwriter, Ron Hamilton wrote, give thanks to the Lord. When do you give thanks? The Bible tells us in Thessalonians, in everything, give thanks. Notice, not out of everything, give thanks, but in everything. You're in it right now. Can you give thanks to God? You say, I, uh, I don't know about that. You know, God hasn't changed. Can you still love him? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Amen. And he says, so Ron wrote this. Give thanks to the Lord, though your testing seems long. In darkness, he giveth a song. That's what he wants to do for you today. Verse 2 goes, I could not see through the shadows ahead. Sometimes you can't see very well when you're going through stuff in life. And life is happening in your, in your life and my life. And like I said, there's some things in your control, some things you brought upon yourself, and there's some things that other people bring upon you that bring trouble to you. You know, listen, parents, if you're not right with God, you're bringing trouble to your kids. You're causing trouble for your kids. Amen. That means you need to get your heart right. Get it right. 
Amen. Whatever it is, you know. So sometimes, so you know, we, we don't see through those shadows. And he says, so I looked at the cross. He looked up. Ron says, hey, I got cancer. I just lost my eye. Amen. You know what you got to do? He says, I looked up. I looked up. Amen. I looked at the cross of my Savior instead. I got my eyes off myself, and I looked up at God. That's what God wants you to do. I bowed to the will of the master that day. You say, I didn't sign up for it. Did Ron Hamilton sign up for it? No, he didn't. It just happened. Things happen in our lives. And he says, I bowed to the will of the master that day. God allowed it. So how are we going to navigate through this? How are we going to deal with this? You know what? I, I, I really believe it was all my heart. Even as Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, he says, when I am weak, I am strong. You know what he's saying by that? He goes through a whole list in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 of all the testings and trials that he had kind of cataloged in his letter, to the second letter to the believers at Corinth. And I mean, what a, what, a, it was all, most, I think all of it was negative. And then when it gets down to chapter 12, he says, you know, one time I was praying to God, I had a thorn in this flesh, you know, it was a messenger of Satan to buffet me. And I just asked God if you would just take it away. He asked the Lord three times for that, and each time God said, no, no, no. You know what? God's answer is not always yes, yes, yes. Amen. So I don't, we, you know, we can argue about what was that thorn in the flesh, you know. There's a million different ideas. But whatever it was, Paul, it was serious enough for Paul to pray for it. If it was a health issue, let me tell you something. The only time that we have a record of that in, in the uh, Pauline epistles is there of Paul, as far as Paul himself, asking God to take something away. And when he begs and pleads with God, God says no. And then when he's all done and said, he tells the Lord, he says, well, listen, if it means the power of Christ can rest upon me, God, I'll, I'll receive it. As a matter of fact, I'll read what else he said in that passage in 2 Corinthians 11 and chapter 12, because he says things that I, I still haven't arrived to that level of spirituality. I'm telling you, I'm still growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. He said this, he says, therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. He said, bring it on, Lord. If I have the power of God in my life, you're going to use me to reach the laws, God. I'm going to do it for your sake. I'm doing I'm going to suffer for your sake. Isn't that what Jesus did for us? Isn't that what it really means to carry your cross? To suffer for Jesus' sake. He did it for us. He did it for others. That's what carrying the cross it's just not you yourself carrying your burden or something like that, but it's doing it. It's doing it for other people. It's what he did. That's what Paul said. Oh, and then Ron wrote in his song, Rejoice in the Lord, I bowed to the will of the master that day. Then peace came and tears fled away. His heart's broken. What can God do? Amen. We might think that. What can God do with me now? I'm one eye less, amen, or I have whatever health problem you're dealing with. What can I do? God could use you. God can use you. You don't think so? Look on the internet. You'll see people who are uh, disabled, and I don't know what the proper words are for all of that stuff, handicapped, missing arms and legs, and blind. Look what God did with Fanny Crosby. I'm blind. You say, you're, if you were blind, God can use Fanny Crosby. He can use you. Amen. Whether you're deaf, you're blind, you're mute, whatever it is, God can receive more glory in our affliction if we go on and serve God with it. Because sometimes, listen, we want, as I said in the 10 o'clock hour, we want God to get us out of it. No, God never promised that. He promised to get you through it. And we don't want to go through it. That takes some patience. That takes patience. Amen. Oh, it's rough. It's rough. What else did he say? The third verse. Now I can see testing comes from above. Amen. Came from God, this test, this trial. Amen. God allowed it. God could have stopped it. Amen. God strengthens his children and purges in love. 
My father knows best. You know, there was a television program back in the 50s, I think it was. It was called My F Father, father Knows Best. There was an actual television show. I mean, that was one of them serials way back then. Father Knows Best. I remember as a kid watching that. Hey, Amen. I'll tell you, he knows best. I know that. I hope your dad, you got a biological father, amen. I hope you, I hope he's there in your life. I hope he's, he's not just, I, I, I mean, I tell you, he's involved in your life. But you know what? He ought to be the person. If you got a son and you are a father, that son ought to look up to you as a role model, as an example. The Bible says in Titus chapter 2, the older are supposed to teach the younger. Amen. He says that about the women. You know the best person to teach your kids? Listen, I thank God for Brother Hazen, Brother Don back there who help up with the kids downstairs, but you know who's the best teacher? is the one that's in the home. It's called mom and dad. Mom and dad. That's where it starts. It starts at home. It doesn't start. You don't drop them off to Sunday school and say, oh, well, I, I don't do any of this. I don't teach them anything all week long and week after week and week, and I want them to make up for all the lack of teaching that I'm supposed to be given. You're, you're hoping for a miracle. You're hoping for a miracle. You better be consistent. Your kids will see the hypocrisy in your lives. You know, boy, I'll tell you, I hope that's not your case today. My father knows best, and I trust in his care. Through purging, more fruit will I bear. That's what Jesus said. John 15, we won't go there, but he says he's got to purge. If, if you bear fruit, he'll purge you. What is purging? It's the same thing as pruning. God said, I got to get rid of some dead weight. Maybe you got some branches and twigs on your branch. You know, I, I think they, do they do that right now? Is that what they're doing? Are they doing all that stuff right now? Is that right? Nod your head. Amen. Anybody here, horticulturist or any got leaning on that green thumb, anything? Amen. I think they do that. You got to clean them up. You know, you go down to the vineyards down in the valley. What are they doing? They probably did that a long time ago. Who knows? Probably do it through the winter. I don't know. I don't know enough of that stuff. You got to clean up the dead wood. Otherwise, what happens is it, it's not going to be as fruitful. You're trying to help the bear more fruit. Get rid of things that are going to take away from the life of the plant. Amen? Get rid of that stuff. And that's what God wants you to do. So when God says, hey, you bear fruit, I'm going to purge you some more. And in the pruning process, it's got to be painful. Amen? Maybe, God, maybe you've got to take care of some business with God. Maybe there's something in your life you know you shouldn't be doing or be involved with, and you need to take care of that. What is it going to take for, for God to work in your heart and your life that for you to take care of that business with him? Amen? You better do some business with him. Amen? And then the, re the, the chorus goes, oh, rejoice in the Lord. He makes no mistake. God never makes a mistake. By the way, can I just say this? He, God never makes a mistake. But let's identify with ourselves personally. It's easy to say, I made a mistake. No, if you sin, say, I have sinned. Too many people have replaced the word mistake in their personal lives for sin. Well, they made a mistake. No, they sinned. Let's call it what it is. Why are we soft peddling sin when Jesus died for that sin? We, we make it sound, it's not all that bad. You didn't do all that bad. Listen, the moment your child disobeys you and you said you can't take, and you just baked all those nice fresh cookies and boy, I tell you, the temptation is there. It's like the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil right in front of you. And those kids are right there and you say, you cannot have any one of those until I tell you. Why? Wow, they got to be on that cooling rack. They got to cool off. Amen? Amen. And you said, no, you cannot. And they take one. You think, oh, that's not a big deal. Really? That's disobedience. What happened to Adam and Eve in the garden? They ate a piece of fruit. They didn't commit adultery. They didn't commit murder. Hey Amen. They ate a piece of fruit. God says, don't eat any fruit off of that tree. So what happened? Changed the whole world, eating a piece of fruit. Don't ever minimize you think, oh, that's just a little thing. It's not important. It is important. Everything's important. Disobedience. The Bible even tells us in 1 Samuel chapter 15, disobedience, is, he equated that to uh, iniquity and idolatry and, and, and witchcraft and rebellion. That's what he said. We don't look at sin the way God looks at it. The Bible says here, look at this now. He knoweth the way that I take. Let's get back. So he says, oh yeah, for when I am tried and purified, I shall come forth as gold. 
God's trying you. Amen. That's what he's doing. So one day, God will bring that trial to the end. He says, I shall come forth. You're coming out, you, but you went through it. Amen. Now you're having to live with whatever took place. And, and also, I shall come forth as gold. God would bring something good from it all. Gold. Do we even know what that's like? Amen. I mean, years ago, and I don't know, America, and I, I mean, I lived in America for 10 years, and I finished my high school in the U.S. I'm a Canadian citizen, but I had a, I had a green card in, in, in America when I lived there. But it, years ago, for every dollar that America printed, they had gold to back it up. <laughs> uh, do, can they even do something like that today? You know what? I'm not trying to scare everybody here, but whether it be Canada, U.S., or any other country, that money that we have, we, you know, I remember when I was a kid, when they first got this colored money in Canada, they, they called it funny money. That's what they call it. They call it funny money because it was colored. Americans, all, they're greenbacks. That's what they are. They're green. And they said this. You know what? You ever read the words on there? It's legal tender as long as the, listen, as long as the government recognizes it. I mean, the, 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 the uh, in, Canadian CDIC only guarantees so much. <laughs> I'm not trying to scare anybody. As long as we're able to trade together and do business together, we can use it. You know what? You need to trust in God. Amen. Boy, I'll tell you. You know what? God says, hey, listen. You know what? God's going to bring something good, and he's only that, but God still valued Job because only precious metal is put through the fire. Why would you put a piece of junk through the fire? Unless you're just burning it to incinerate it. Why, why would you put gold? Because you want to purify it. There's a process. I remember when I worked in a machine shop in Niagara Falls for, for 14 years out of the 17 I was there. And I worked, uh, I was part of a crew of uh, between the plant manager and another person. And we would do audits on Atlas Alloys in Welland, Ontario. So I'd go in that plant and we're doing an uh, 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 audit to ISO 9000 standards. We walk in that plant, make sure everything, we, they dot their I's and cross their T's. And any questions we had, we'd go in a boardroom. We'd be talking to the management team there to make sure that hey, we identified some, some deficiencies and you folks not following ISO 9000. And we would go in there. But I remember walking into that building. I don't even know if it still exists anymore in Welland. But we'd go in that building, and they had this huge pot and there would be this big thing that, uh, with a magnet on it, pulling all these metals and dropping in this pot. And I mean, it was wonderful in the middle of wintertime, but I can't imagine what it would be like in the summertime in that building. And the doors are wide open because you don't have to worry about heat. That pot is melting down, and we, we, we bought stainless 316 from them and other different grades of stainless. But I'm telling you something, that place was hot. I can't imagine. What are we doing? You're, you're purifying. You're trying to make something for the finer, something for the better. That's what God's trying to do with you today. He's not trying to kill you. He's not trying to, he's not trying to do any of those things. If you're, listen, if you are right with God and you're going through something right now, God is just trying to make you better. Can you accept that? Can you accept that? Oh, he says, and I, Job says, and I shall come forth as gold. I shall come forth as gold. Oh, let me ask you four questions. I know we got to wrap up here. So God knows the way that you take. Let me ask you this. Number one, do you know your own way? Which way are you going? Isaiah 55, 8 and 9 says this. We have a real habit of not knowing and understanding God's ways and God's thoughts. Many times, our thoughts and ways don't line up with God. How do you stay in line with God? you got to stay in line with his word. Number two, it is, is it a comfort to you that God knows your way? Aren't you glad for that? But do you know your way? Do you know where you're going? Amen. Number three, are you tried in the way? So you're in the way. 
Maybe you feel, you know, there's no hidden sin. You're not perfect, you know, but you're, there's no hidden sin. You're not rebelling against God, but you're going through something. So you're being tried while you're in the way, in the right way, in God's way. That happened. That happened to Job. It's happened to many, many others. Let me ask you this. And if so, if you're tried in the way, have you confidence in God to the result of that trial? Are you confident? Can you trust God in that? Because he said there, hey, that when he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. But how does this all fit in, Pastor? One last thing. You're in Job. Look at this. That's why I had Brother Hazen read these other two verses. My foot, verse 11, hath held his steps. His way have I kept and not declined. Now watch this. Neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. Are you ready? I have esteemed the words of his mouth. Whose words? God's words. The words of his mouth more than my necessary food. You know the food that keeps you alive? Job said this. What's more important to me is the word of God than my day-to-day -day food. I'm just going to ask you some simple questions here, and we're done. How much time have you taken to eat this week? To eat. Did God get an equal amount of minutes and hours? Is our food more important than God's word? Did not Jesus say when he was tempted of the devil, and the devil says, hey, Jesus, change these stones and make them into bread. And Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. He says, listen, he gave a principle, and he said this, listen, listen, we need bread, listen, to stay physically alive, amen? But the reality is this, we really minimize his words. We don't spend as much time as we probably should in the word of God. Do you know what's getting Job through this? And he did not even have the books of Moses. This predated the books of Moses. He heard God speak. Those are the words he had. Oh, I'm telling you, the Bible teaches us in the gospel accounts, Jesus said, to whomsoever much is given, much is required. We have 66 books. Job never had one book at all. But he said, I esteem the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. That's what got him through this thing. How's, how's it going with you? Amen? Oh, I tell you, some of us should be ashamed that we spend more time eating than we spend time in prayer and the Word. Amen? We don't appreciate God as much as we should. We really, the Bible says in Psalm 1 and 2, he says, um, blessed is the man, amen, whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Amen. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 3, Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein. Hey, even at the end of the book. Amen. And here we got a book that predated Moses, and the, the law of Moses. And Job saying, hey, those words, I esteem them. Oh, they're high in value to me. Amen. The words of God, the words of his mouth, more than my necessary food. I need to spend time with God more than I need to have my next meal. I wonder if our priorities need to be rearranged in our life. You know, the old-time Christians, you read over in Paul's letter to Timothy, it says there, you know, um, that God created everything to be eaten. That's what he says. And he said this, that when you do eat, he said this, it's sanctified by the word of God and prayer. You know what the old-time Christians used to do? When they sat down all together, that's pretty rough in 2024 to, to be able to do that, Get everybody sitting together at the same time. Hey Amen. Someone's alarm's going off. 
<laughs> I know, it's time for to stop the preaching, eh? You get everybody together. Do you pray? Well, you listen, when you go out, do you pray before your meal? You go to Swiss Chalet, wherever you eat? Oh, I wouldn't do that. I'm just uh, a machine, you know. Just, really? Richard Wormbrandt. Richard Wormbrandt was tortured and persecuted for his faith. One time they had him in the U.S. years ago, and they said, Brother Wormbrandt, would you please um, pray for our meal? They had all these people gathered, and maybe some pastors there. <laughs> he stood up. He'd been through so much. He said, well, what happened? He went through it. Look him up on the Internet. I can't say some things that they made him do. It was terrible. He stood up in that restaurant. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him here, creature here below. He sang that whole thing. That would be embarrassing. Would it? He loved God. He'd been through so much. Been hurt so much. He loved God a lot. I'm not ashamed of my Savior. And he sang that song before he ate his food. Oh, I pray today. I hope you. Listen, listen. I don't know what you're going through, but listen. Listen, you're saying, I'm going through something, Pastor. I'm going through some trial here. Hey, listen, be patient. We talked about that at 10 a.m. God will get you through it. Amen. You say, you don't know what I'm going through. You're 100% right, but all I got is your word to talk to you about it. There's people in this book that have gone through that, and there's people in history who have gone through things just like you, or maybe even worse. I don't know. You say, you're right. I've never been through what you've been through. Listen, there's some things you've never been through that maybe I've been through. We're not going to play that game today, but God will get you through it. He loves you. You're saved today. He loves you. Amen. He loves you. He cares for you. He's taking care of you. Amen. You got a roof over your head. You got heat at home. Amen. You got food in the fridge. Praise God. You don't have to go looking for daily bread. Some people, they're looking for their next meal in different countries in this world this morning or this afternoon. That's what they're doing. They're looking for their, they don't have the next meal. Every day they're looking for their next meal. What are we going to eat today? Where are we going to find this meal? Look at us. Look at us. I think sometimes we're so ungrateful for what God has done and what God's blessed us with. Oh, oh, God help us today. God help us today. Hey, listen, today, he knoweth the way that you take. And when he's trying you and he's testing you, he says, I'll bring you forth as gold for the better. I'm going to make you better. But it's through the trial and the test and the fire and the heat. That's why we saying, lead us, God leads us along. We don't like the fire part, the floods and the fire and all of that. Amen. But God says, I'm trying to make you for the finer. That's what I'm trying to do for you today. Oh, God help us today. Let's all stand and we'll close in prayer.